Welcome back, Novello Nation, to another episode of the Aaron Novello Podcast. We have with us an absolute legend in the real estate game. He did something that many people aspire to, uh, built a team uh, and a brokerage up to 798 units, $5.4 million in GCI. And then he sold a portion of it, not his team. And then he traveled around the world uh, for seven or eight months with his family on a sailboat. And now he's back in the real estate game, the one and only Mr. Josh Barker. I appreciate you taking the time to be with me, brother. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Excited yeah. about uh, doing this with you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, man. So I guess first and foremost, like uh, as I was preparing and we did a little chatting and, you know, in preparation for uh, getting the episode started, the first question that popped into my head when I had heard that like, hey, Josh is like, he's back and he's actually getting back into real estate. The first question that popped into my head was like, why? <laughs> because I'm aware you've done, I feel like people look to you, Josh, and they're like, yeah. man, like if I could only do that and you've done it. And I also know because we were in a mastermind group for a little bit that you're a very purpose and kind of mission driven person. So sure. I knew there had to be a purpose and a mission. So uh, what exactly is that purpose and mission for you? Sure. Well, um, at the out there, you know, my wife and I had reached our financial goals that we had set. And one of the things we promised ourselves is that when we did that, that we were going to take some time off. And COVID presented a uh, perfect opportunity for us because uh, I had a 21-year-old daughter, an 18-year-old daughter who were both home, you know, due to COVID, one from college, one from high school, in between boyfriends and willing to go sailing with mom and dad. So um, with our five-year-old son. So um, we just said, hey, let's, let's do it now. Financially, we were ready for it. And, um, you know, we thought that that was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We can always make more money, but you can't always have that memory. So we took them and went and did it, but, and we were gone for about a year. Um, and then uh, we were thought we were going to be gone longer, but uh, I think I shared with you before this call that uh, we had an opportunity to uh, adopt a little girl. And so um, that little girl came into our lives. She's four months old now. And uh, when we found out she was born, we turned the boat around and rushed back to get her uh, because uh, she was closely related to our family. And um, so that was what we did. We, uh, we came home. So um the real estate piece is interesting, but uh, like I think I was sharing with you that uh, real estate for me, um, it's what I know. Um, I wanted to do it a little differently this time. Uh, last time I wanted to be the very best listing agent I could possibly be. And, um, you know, I think that uh, we reached some of the goals we had set in that area. Now I'd like to run the very best real estate company that I can possibly run. Yeah. And um, so I'm, this is, uh, uh, you know, having a very viable company, providing good value and service to the market and a very, uh, a changing environment of real estate. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Hey, anybody in your geographic area needs to watch out because Josh is back in the game, my friend. And, and it's just a hobby at this point, like you're saying, because you're just really interested in it. And what I'm aware of, based on what you just described to me, it's presenting itself as just another challenge. Because when you said you wanted to be the best listing agent you could be, I mean, you're being humble, man. Like how many listings at the end were you actually taking? Um, I had three years in a row where I was averaging between 340, 350 listings. Each, uh, Did you guys person. hear that? Did you hear what he just said? 340 to 350 personally as an individual yeah. agent. Now that would require you to be on how many like appointments a week? Um, I was going on just over 400 appointments a year. So I was averaging between 75 and 80% of, of appointment per, uh, listing ratio. And it was, uh, so in a week, I mean, it would just depend on what time of the year, because obviously we're front loaded more. So March through uh, about August, I'm, I'm running really hard. Six days a week is very common. And then um, for the balance of the year, it would drop down to a five day a week uh, work week. So um, it was significant. There was many days where it was two or three listing appointments every day. Um, and you just, you had to move fast. Um, you know, that what I learned was, is that, you know, we had a lot of sim similar mentors that were coaching at the time. And um, anything that was a non-income producing activity and anything that was administrative related, I was able to, with a great team, um, a wonderful team that really supported me, I was able to get a lot of that work uh, to them, which would free me up to go out and do the most important thing I could do at the time, which was to get a home listed. Um, that seemed to be something where my value showed up is uh, getting commitments from homeowners and negotiating quickly. Um, those are the two things that I did really well. Um, we did have a sales team, you know, so... Like you said, I didn't do all, um, you know, 798 of those deals. Um, I had a team of about nine agents on average that assisted me with that. So they were also listing homes in some cases and some of them 
Uh, we're uh, working with a lot of buyers, for example. Um, but uh, my personal production was 340, 350, and we still listed another 150, 200 homes on top of that as a team. Yeah, which is amazing because what I'm aware of is, you know, I've been on two or three appointments a day and that requires a lot of like mental, physical, like spiritual, emotional energy to do that consistently, like day after day after day. And yep. what you shared, which is very interesting, is now the new challenge is, is how can I run the best like company, right? Instead of just being the best listing yep. agent, which you achieved, you're like the Heisman Trophy winner of listing property, like you won a Super Bowl of that, you know, three years in a row. So now can, how can I run the best real estate team? So talk to me about the difference in the thinking, because that requires two different mental maps. It really does. You know, I think it comes down to, to leadership. I, I was able to, I, I, that my team gave me a lot of, uh, of flexibility in my leadership style back then, the previous time, because I was running so fast. It was basically like, hey, just do what I'm doing and follow me, I'll lead the way, right? And it was like, I could lead with that example and um, so some of the shortcuts I would probably take in the leadership aspect were made up for by me going out there and getting it done every day. So, um, so they, they gave me a lot of respect from that, from that uh, which made it easier for them and for me. Um, now it's really about becoming a better leader, period, like developing great talent, recruiting great talent, developing great talent, encouraging them uh, to be productive, um, scaling systems and process and training and client services and all the things that are necessary. Um, being extremely thoughtful about um, lead generation, uh, lead conversion, and of course the capacity to provide that value and service to the market. I mean, these are all things that um, you have to think about at a high, high level when you wanna do what we wanna do. That's exactly right. And what just emerged is like uh, that mental map of like attraction with leads and then conversion sure. and then delivery, delivery of that service. So now your focus in the past, you would delegate away as much as you possibly could, and you essentially did. That didn't yep. involve you being on appointments or negotiating deals. That allowed you to list 340, 350 homes a year. And yep. now what the shift in focus is, is, okay, well, how can I teach others to do, to kind of replicate, right? How can I take yep. my software that's in my head, download it to them, give them leadership and yep. support? How do, how do you use what we know into them and have more impact? I mean, you know, all the results that I'd like to see this company uh, deliver to the marketplace, I have to achieve through people now. Um, no longer can it just be Josh going, all right, I'll do one more appointment. No problem. I'll just, I'll just take it. Right. And now it's no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make sure that our team is scaled properly to provide that value and that service. Um, I believe it's going to have a bigger contribution to our team. I'll have a bigger contribution to the clients we get to serve because you know, they won't be as tight on time as I was in that final season before I, you know, before I went sailing. So um, you know, and I do think that the industry is changing. I think there's a disruption there. There's an argument to be had of, you know, what is the industry going to be in the future? And um, I really very much want to have, I want to have my say, you know, and I want our company to be able to have a word in that. And, um, you know, you can't, you can't have a word if you're not here to have that word. Um, and that's a big reason why I want to do it. I think that, I think we have some ideas for the future in the industry. And I think that um, we want to have those ideas heard. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about like how you perceive in your mind, because we were talking a little bit, you know, again, off uh, camera before we got started about yeah. how you see things changing, because you've been doing this for how long? You've been in the real estate business for how long? Over 20 years now. Yeah. So the, I'm imagining like what your experience was 20 years ago, and what it is today is just like dramatically different. It's a completely different game. So it's like specifically, how do you see that changing? Well, I mean, obviously the biggest change was the, the consumer transparency, right? So when I came in the business, the MLS was a, um, you know, like a DOS program that agents had access to, but the public didn't. There was no websites for consumers to search for homes. And so you would write these overly promising ads that cause consumers to call on them. And then you would um, show them that property, which normally wasn't what they thought about it would be. And then you'd switch them to better properties and sell them those properties. And so that was kind of normal for what the industry was 20 years ago. And then, you know, as the internet is, has come to become the, the, the tool, obviously it's here, um, the consumer's now searching. It, it's changing who's responsible for what, right? So before it was the agents sharing what was available in the market. Today, the agents don't do that as much. The consumers are the ones that know what's available and they're requesting access from the agents and so that's a big shift it's given an opportunity for you know realtor.com and zillow and companies similar to that to come into the space 
provide access to consumers to those properties um, and now sell those lead opportunities to agents. And, and to your point, I mean, that's probably one of the biggest transformations we've seen over the last 10 years is just how aggressive and how successful that model has proven to be. Yeah, because we were talking about it where, you know, I have the good fortune, I coach a lot of the, you know, a lot of agents across the country and a handful of them are very productive, you know, seven figure earners. And I've witnessed over the last 24 months, and even in my own business, where um, on the listing side, that's become 20 to 30% of their business now are these platforms, right? So what you're describing is there's the client and then there's the agent. And when right. you first started, there was nothing in between. No. And now no, what's no. in between is the internet. And then there's, there's different business models that are popping up around that. One is where they want to sell their own products and services. That would be like a Zillow or Redfin. And then the second is, is um, they're not interested in the products and services, their own, they just want a referral fee. And that's their entry into the transaction, but then they're getting into ancillary services around it. Is that right? Yeah, yeah you're totally right. I mean, it's, um, you know, they're, they're selling leads now, you know, Zillow's selling leads and, and some of it's as a referral instead, right? And agents just, they just have to keep in mind that even though, you know, they're, they're selling you access to their lead opportunities, the referrals, are you actually purchasing it? They don't control that lead that they only have a copy of the leads, right? So all of us have our own systems out there that are generating lead opportunities outside of Zillow and Realtor.com. And if you if you were to look at them more closely, you'd see that there's a pretty significant overlap between the leads that you can generate on your own and what Zillow is gonna sell you. Um, the question is, is your percentage high enough that it doesn't make sense to work with Zillow as a partner on the Flex program or Realtor.com through you know agent uh, or uh, uh, OpCity and, and, those, and companies like that. So. Um, but I would be mindful of it. I, I you know, we're, we're not going to 100 percent go in the space of working with them directly. I think we're going to try to build some models, and some systems independent of those sources, because I think that long term, those companies that do choose to build independent will probably be more viable than if you get addicted to the <laughs> to what they're selling you over time. It's instead of a 35 percent referral fee, the next thing you know, it's a 40 percent referral fee. Now, it's just going to slowly escalate. Yeah, whoever controls the lead controls how much it costs. And what I'm also aware of, I read a really interesting book called Machines, Platforms, and Crowds. Mm -hmm. And it was talking about how those three things are converging at the same time to radically change commerce. Machines being artificial intelligence right. or automation. Um, platforms being platforms like a Zillow or a Facebook or Uber or Airbnb. And then crowds where you can crowdsource money and ideas like via the internet very quickly. Yep. And in the book, though, it said something interesting, which was that you know, in the future, uh, knowledge workers or people that are very good at what they do, they're not going to work for like, they, they talked about an attorney, they're not going to work for like one firm. What they'll right. do is they'll work for many firms and there will be one central platform that processes everything and brings the two together. Yep. And what was so interesting is when I read that, and that was like a couple of years ago, I like had to put the book down. I'm like, wait a minute, that's happening already in our industry. Because we it work is. for like, you know, I work for Keller Williams, then I also work for Fast Expert and Homelight. And effective eight and all these other companies that are sending leads and my experience is like with that flex like you were saying they want all of your time like they want you to be their employee essentially they they monitor what you're doing they monitor the calls they monitor conversion rates right like you're essentially working for them yeah it's um flex is interesting to me only because it's something a little bit near and dear to my heart we were we were purchasing quite a bit of uh, zillow leads up until let's say a year or half a year and a half ago and I was very much vested in that investment. So, you know, as, as I purchased those leads, and at the time, I don't remember what the number would have been, but let's say it was $65 to $100 a lead, if that's what it was. I, I very much wanted to see our team convert in those opportunities because it was such an expensive opportunity to create, right? Where now, I think if people were to buy those same leads in, the, in a market, if you could even do it, there are probably $300 a lead, right? So Zillow now is asking team leaders to run these sales teams to hold them accountable, but the sales team leader didn't buy those leads in the first place. So they're not out the same money if they don't convert. And, and all they're doing, I've talked to these agents, all they're doing is they're simply taking the spend that they were allocating to Flex or to Zillow at the time. Now they're reallocating it to, uh, to other investments. So Zillow's Flex program, in my opinion, made Realtor.com more profitable. Mm -hmm. That makes total sense to me. That, yeah, the revenue they were taking at the time from, you know, from the agent now that went on to a flex program is now simply purchasing Realtor.com leads. That's so interesting. So, you know, so I guess my question to you would be is being that you, you know, see 
these changes and shifts that are happening, what do you think agents should be doing to pivot? Because what I'm aware of is a lot of agents, uh, they're intimidated by technology. A lot of agents are intimidated by the fact that, you know, business is very much so like an evolution and no model lasts forever. Like eventually it's going to change and we're in the midst of one of those changes, right? Like again, aggressive, sharp elbow competitors pushing into the space, getting in front of potential clients before we do. Sure. So what pivots do you think agents need to be making right now? Uh, be very proactive on generating a very large database of buyers that are not even ready to purchase for the next, you know, 18 months. You know, if, if Zillow has done anything really well, it's just that they've been nurturing these customers you know, through um, access to their system or delivering, you know, market alerts to them over an extended period of time. All, most agents are like focused on, I want what converts now. And that's okay, but that's what everybody wants. And so um, you're only going to have access to so many people are ready to do something now. The people that make a longer commitment to conversion, lead conversion, and you don't have to do it yourself. You could have an ISA or multiple ISAs or VAs, that kind of thing. But you have to start nurturing these opportunities much earlier in the process. You need to get start getting these people 12 months, 18 months before, because then the relationship is strengthened to the point. You've provided enough value and service to a point where when they are ready to transact, you'll have the opportunity to be one of the two or three people to request information from. I have with us an absolute rock star, 2 million plus GCI producer, 180 plus units. I've had the good fortune of working with her uh, for about a year now uh, in her business, Miss Christy Morrison, the pride and joy of Truckee. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Of course. Yeah, I appreciate uh, the opportunity. I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're super busy, not only with uh, a huge real estate business that you run, but I know you also have a little tribe, right? You got five uh, kids and I think they're at the house right now. So um, I always do my best to bring people to the platform that I think can add a lot of value. And I know you definitely fit that criteria. So one of the things I wanted to share with you, because I know this year for you has really been a breakout year and there's various different reasons for that. And we can talk about that. I guess what I'm interested in is share with the audience what you were doing kind of prior to 12 to 18 months ago before we started uh, working together. Great. So uh, I've been a real estate agent since 1999, actually, so quite a while. Um, I started training with the Mike Ferry organization uh, back in 2001 and uh, was really committed to the foundations of learning how to sell and prospect and make calls and generating a profitable business. And uh, I think over the last probably three to five years, probably from like 2018 or so, I really found myself getting into a, a rut where I was, you know, just really just trying to make as many calls and just be as successful as I could. But I was probably stuck at about doing between like 70, 60 to 70 transactions. And I'm in a second home market. And, you know, our, our markets fairly uh, ha had been fairly stable, so we didn't have a lot of growth and we didn't have a lot of decline. So I think in a, a stable market, you have to be right on with your pricing else the property won't sell. So you've got to be if you're not right, then you've got to get really good at doing price reductions and like getting that aspect going. So but I felt like I just was not really. I felt like I was grinding a lot, I guess. And the grind was getting old. I mean, you know, 20 years. And I was just like, when is this going to be over? Um, I felt like I was on a hamster wheel most of the time, just like running, 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 and just staying kind of sort of the same. And really not having, um, you know, always like struggling with balancing my time between um, you know, hanging out with my kids and, you know, I love being outdoors and riding horses and skiing and mountain biking. And, and I love that part of my life, but I wasn't able to do that. And just like, so relationships and fun. And it, it, for me, it was like almost all work. So I could, it just was hitting a rut. And I know when we first started talking, um, you know, I was just like, I was over it. Like, I'm over it. Like, how do I stop this? Like, I'm done. Right. And that's when we started working with each other. 
That's awesome. So I wrote a few things down, right? The first one is, is that uh, you were doing, you know, very good business, right? It's a good place to be stuck, so to speak, 67 right, deals. Yeah. And in your marketplace, um, you know, average price point, you know, you were making very good money. At the same time, you noticed a few things. One, it was entirely dependent upon you kind of, you know, beating the bushes and kind of banging it out, right? Um, and you were very good at going and finding people, and uh, there wasn't a lot of kind of energy or effort or emphasis or awareness around trying to create an environment that makes it easy for people to find you. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. talk to people a little bit about that. Cause that was a new yes. like thought process completely. Right. I mean, I just always thought from the time I started is like, I needed to find them. Right. And I thought that also like for them to find me was a very expensive ordeal that in the end I wouldn't be able to, you know, make a profit. Right. So that was just like my weird mindset. And, um, yeah, once we move from that, there are a lot of simple things that really don't cost very much money at all that bring business to you, um, and bring calls in. And I mean, I bet you remember like, once we started implementing a few simple techniques, people were calling me and I was just like, oh my God, thank God. So instead of it hundred percent being me chasing people, you know, it'd be like one to two deals. And that's kind of where it is right now. One to two deals just kind of flow in, in to my business now, which is a big relief. And now I can see, okay, how do I build on that? You know, I, I mean, I, I love, I mean, I'm probably one of those crazy people. I do love like, pro I love, like talking to people. I love finding deals. Like I like that part, but it, it now doesn't have to be a hundred percent of how I grow my business. Now it can be like 20, 30%, right? At the most. That's exactly right. So I wrote down something here, which was interesting is that um, I learned from going to uh, business mastery, Tony Robbins. He says that it's always the psychology of the owner that keeps a business back or stuck. Yes. And, and what you said right. here, which was interesting, which was very interesting is this, you were telling yourself a story and the story was like getting people to find me is very expensive and therefore not profitable. And I don't want to do it. And then one of the things we began to talk about is like, Hey, there's some like either inexpensive or free ways that you can create an environment that's conducive for people to reach out to you. And then once they reach out to you, because Christy Morrison is a rock star salesperson. Now it's just about conversion. Now it's just about, you know, knowing what to say and how to say it. And you got that part, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And and as we create an environment, it becomes like you're saying less dependent on the like go, 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 grind, grind, grind. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and the go, go, go grind like turns into being like a little more creative. Like how can I reach out to my clients? Um, and like the whole relationship thing too, because like, oh, okay, well, now I can actually focus on building a relationship with people. And that actually has a nice return with referrals. And it just makes you feel better, actually. So now it's just like, oh, wow. Okay. It's not all about like, who's my next call? It's about like, who are these people? What do they like? What are they into? What are they looking for? What are their goals? And then like how we can share on that, how I can help them with that. And it just is a much uh, more graceful way of selling real estate, I guess. Yeah, that's a wonderful way of putting it. And then talk to the audience about uh, what we started to implement and have conversations around as far as those things that are either free or very inexpensive to get people to reach out to you. I mean, the easiest thing is reviews. And, uh, right. And, You're and here's what's reading. interesting. So, and yeah. I'm aware when we started to working together, like I Googled you, right. And I was like, Christy, like, you're such a rock star, but like, I can't tell you look like everybody else. And you, I yes. remember you being on the other end being like, uh, but you're such like you implement things so fast. And once that clicked in your brain, you really ran with that. So, so talk to everybody about that and talk to everybody what the result has been because of it. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I think like with the reviews, I mean, obviously you've got to look at Zillow. I mean, most people, at least here on the West coast, look at the agent if online, whether, and I think they, you know, go to Zillow most of the time at Google too, but they're going to like check you out. So even if you're 
calling just listed, just sold. I mean, I'm finding when you hang up the phone, they're like online, like checking you out. So you just need to make sure that when they check you out, A, you're on there and B, you have reviews. And I think that if you give any good customer service, people want to give back to you and want to give you those reviews. So we're, I'm definitely still working on that. It is a work in progress, of course, because again, in my nature, it's like sell a house, go to the next one, sell a house, go to the next one. Like that's my nature, but I'm now trying to like slow down, stop. Like this is what's important. And I mean, seriously, once I really started focusing on getting the reviews up again, instantly, I was, I was getting calls from sellers that want to list their properties because they want to list their homes with, you know, people that give good service and, and have the reviews. So that was number one. Um, and then number two, which really pushed me out of my box too, was like videos, right? Like yeah. <laughs> I was doing like, I'd find like, I, I'm doing business updates, um, neighborhood specials. I did a special on like what was happening during COVID and how people were coping with it. But like, I, first of all, I don't, I, I'm not a big Facebooker or anything. I don't even, I don't even like, I'd rather be outside. So like, I don't even really know exactly how it works, but I've been trying, right. And trying to like get on video. And I mean, I was so scared to even like send something out with me in it. Remember? And I just, what you've taught me and what I, what I really embrace in my life too, is like, if it makes me nervous or makes me scared, I should just do it, you know? And we're not talking about doing that on the physical world, like jumping off a huge cliff or something like that, which I like too. But we're talking about like simple things like, oh, go interview somebody and post it. Like, okay, yes. why is that so scary? It's not like, go do it, right? So yeah. just those And I appreciate that. And I love that because you're, you're being really authentic, right? So, because people might look at you and be like, wow, I mean, she's like 180 transactions, like so, like 2 million plus a GCI. She must be fearless. And I'm aware when we first had that conversation, it was like, mm, like, I don't know if I'm cool with that. Right. Or you'd be like, yeah, okay. And then like a week would go by or two weeks would go by. I'm like, you do that yet? And you're like, ah, right. And what I'm aware of is there's two barriers to entry, right. Uh, as you know, now to that one is kind of people think the technology is like overwhelming and it's not, it's really easy. The second is, is insecurity. Mm -hmm. It's being in front of a camera and being okay with that, right? Mm -hmm. But once you embrace that, like we let the lion out of the cage, right? Because now I heard you mention um, you're doing like live streams at properties, you're shooting videos around that, creating the kind of that HGTV effect, but just for, you know, Christy Morrison and her team. And um, you're also beginning to shoot hyper local content for specific communities and putting that to your website which is gonna cause you to start to show up organically when people are searching in your geographic area. And then you're already starting to see a byproduct of that, which is that you know, when people Google your area, you're showing up organically in, in the yes. Google search, which is huge, right? Yes. And I think the other thing that you really pushed me on too was um, client parties. <laughs> and I was, I mean, I love a good party. Like, don't get me wrong, but like, I just was not comfortable with like inviting people to get together. And this was pre COVID obviously. Um, and now we're going to do some other things to incorporate that back in now that we're, you know, still in the COVID situation, but like, that was so scary. Like inviting, setting an event up, like inviting all my past clients over and, you know, my center and, of influence. And, and talk to everybody like what, because remember this goes back to like, it's always the psychology of the owner that keeps a business mm -hmm. kind yes. of tamped down. Mm -hmm. Talk yeah. to me about like, what was the story? Like, why was that like a thing for you? Like, why was that? Why was there resistance? I just didn't think anyone was going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> so the story you told yourself, like, it's a waste of time. Like, it's silly, yeah. right? And yeah, yet like, when we did it the first time, yeah. what did you actually notice experientially? Oh my God. People were so awesome. They were like, great. They were grateful. They were happy. I got a bunch of reviews. Like it was a great community event and it felt really good. And, and the two things too, I wanted to say about that is like, okay, I probably invited whatever, 200, 300 people, but like 25 people showed up, but it wasn't just who showed up. It was the, um, getting every, like the intro to it and calling people and inviting them and having a conversation 
and all of that. So by the time the event occurred, it didn't even really matter. Right. And and I rem- and I'm aware that that's I'm so glad you brought that up because that's one of the major stumbling blocks for people is they think in their head like, oh, well, what if nobody shows up? But what I'm aware of is that's not really where all the value is. It's part of the value, right? Where where the full value comes into play is you had to call them to uh, yes. you know invite them. You maybe yes. sent a bomb bomb video out to the database to let them know, and yes. then at the event, you have a videographer who shoots it and then you blast that out to people and that's another touch. And then you say, thank you when they show up. So it's like, you're hitting them multiple different times. And if you do that a few times a year, uh, you know, you're also creating a a community in a way Yes. Mm -hmm. where where you're the leader of the tribe and it's, uh, it's good to be the leader of the tribe. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And And we, we read that uh, book, super fans, I forget who's, who the author is, but that book is magic. And I always refer back to it, actually. You reminded me on our last call about that book, but that's that's how you create, you know, your super fans who give you business. And, you know, when you're doing deals with your super fans and with their referrals, it's so much easier. Yeah. Just the whole process is a totally different level. Yeah. And for those who may not kind of understand that concept of super fans, the idea is, is if you have like a super fan, somebody who like knows you, loves you, and is willing to uh, like scream from the mountaintops that you're an awesome person, they basically drag people to you. Like, hey, you have to talk to Christy. Like, don't talk to anybody else. You got to talk to her. She's the best at what she does, right? And I remember being on a call with you and that clicking in your brain when I said to you, like, Christy, how many super fans do you need in order to do the amount of business that you want? And you were like, 50. <laughs> <laughs> like it's not that many, right? Yeah. So what I'm hearing from you as well is this shift from solely being focused on units. And the idea is, of course, we always want to you know, do more units. At the same time, having that be the only kind of measure of growth and instead beginning to shift to curating like an experience, mm-hmm. right? And I have with me today the luminary the legendary, the 60 plus million dollar man and gross commissions over his career. He's been a friend of mine for a long time, a mentor of mine, a role play partner of mine. He's made an incredible impact in my life. The pride and joy of Santa Clarita, Mr. Neil Weichel. Indeed. How are you, my man? Uh, it's great to see you. Usually when we have these conversations, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no face to it. That's exactly right. I won't tell you to shave, I promise. <laughs> well, this is great. And I always do my best to uh, you know, have people on the platform that I think can add tremendous value. And you are definitely one of those humans. So for those who haven't had the good fortune of hearing about your experience, I thought it would be interesting to bring people back. Because you, when I think about you, I think about like this iron, like horse, right? You've been doing this for 28 plus years in a very disciplined, very consistent manner, Mm -hmm. high level technician, like world-class listing agent. And it all started, I remember you told me a story where in college, you actually sold books door to door. Yeah. People think real estate's tough. <laughs> so I'm curious. Try that from eight to nine thirty every day. <laughs> yeah, and and I think what's so interesting about that, like, so if you could, like, you said from eight thirty, you know, till late in the 7:59, afternoon. Seven fifty nine, Aaron. If you didn't knock on your first door at seven fifty nine, you were off schedule, and they put the fear of God into you that if you are off schedule, forget it. So I can tell you, book people make great real estate people because. Uh, they are very, very in tune to the idea of not wasting time and that every demonstration needs to be made. Uh, knowing your numbers. I mean, you know, you're 18 years old and they're teaching you scripts and dialogues and how to knock on a door and stand a certain way. Yeah, I mean, it was formative for me, for sure. Uh, three summers, very, very difficult, very challenging job, but it made me, you know, a different person to be sure. Yeah, I imagine it did. And I guess I'm curious because that is not, I imagine the attrition rate for that is extremely high. It's and over 90, it's over 90%. Wow. Yeah. So what, was there a time like as you were doing that and whether a different weather or like raining or hot or you didn't feel like it, like, was there a time where just Neil was like, you know what, like this is, yeah, I can do this. And this is something that I can see myself doing kind of moving forward. 
Yeah, because, you know, when you're young, you have no idea what you're going to do with your life, right? I know some people that are in their 20s, including my son, who's still not entirely sure what they're going to do with their life. And that's OK. Uh, but at that time, um, you know, I didn't even know exactly what my major should be in college. And after my first summer, I was relatively successful. I thought, you know, I'm good with people and I enjoy people. I didn't like the rejection, but I, I, I figured out a way to, to tolerate it. And uh, I thought, you know, I, I, I think business is the direction that I should go in. So, you know, you never know when the smallest little decision in your life is going to literally change it. Uh, and for me, that was, you know, that was definitely one. Uh, yeah. And I'm curious because I imagine the rejection was massive. So you said initially, you know, you didn't like it, but you learned to deal with it. So like, how, how did you learn to deal with it? Um, there is a gigantic amount of positive mental attitude taught to you. And I mean, I could spend the entire podcast talking about this and I certainly won't, but you're taught to wake up at the same time every day. You're taught to take a cold shower because that reinforces the commitment you made to getting alive, excited and full of energy. You're taught to do the bookman song after you have breakfast with your, uh, with your roommates. You're taught to knock on your first door at 7.59. You're taught to never make a demonstration more than 20 minutes. You're taught to close four times, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you do this you know, for your summer, right? Because you're in school you know, and then you leave and, and you go and you do this. So what do you learn from it? You learn that selling is universal. Selling is asking questions. Seller is looking somebody in the eye and asking them about themselves. In my case, I was selling an educational book. So I was always asking about kids. Right. And you would go door to door and you'd say, hi, I'm Neil with Southwestern. We're showing the study guide to all the folks that have kids that are school age. And it's a great book with math and history. And a lot of people use it. I was just wondering, do you have kids that are school age or does anybody on the block have kids that are school age? Now, if most people want to help you. So you always start with maybe you could help me out. Right. Because people like to help you. I mean, I can do the whole script to this day. Right? And that's what I love. Like, I just we were just talking about it and like boop, just comes right out like like you did it like, you know, yesterday sort of thing. And I'm aware that it was a long, long time ago. So yeah. what I'm taking from you is you learned a few things like one is that selling is a universal thing and it's not bad or nasty or like it's just a normal thing. You also learn that rejection is part of the sales process. Very much so. Very much so. And you learn the power, it sounds like of having a regimented schedule yep. and the power of asking questions, very specific, purposeful questions uh, to find out, you know, kind of where people were at. And when I think about you, I think you're, you know, one of the masters in this game around asking questions. Again, I've learned a ton from you. So you did that for three summers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. One very successful, one very unsuccessful and one that was, I'd get myself a C plus, but it was, uh, it was, uh, it was formative. I mean, it, it, it because, you know, and, and, and people are going to hear maybe, you know, wow, this guy sold all these houses and made all this money. Let, let, let's make no mistake. Everybody from Tom Brady tomorrow to everybody listening to me, certainly in my second summer where I thought I would just show up and people would invite me into their homes and sign on the dotted line. I mean, I was an idiot. OK, because I crashed and burned at a very high level that second summer. I quit. I came home and the guilt was so high that I called my student manager back there and I said, hey, I need to come back and finish the summer no matter how badly I do. And I did. It was it was. Oh, boy. I mean, it was uh, it was soul searching time, I'll tell you. But but. In hindsight, I wouldn't change any of it. At the time, I was, you know, I wanted to go under a rock and hide. It was so painful. But um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, I wouldn't be where I am today without that experience. I can tell that based on what you just described. Now, you had told me that story before, but not in that detail. And having heard it in that way, it's very clear to me that that experience shaped and molded a lot of your personal philosophy, a lot of, you know, kind of your approach to things. So that's such, that, that's such a, awesome, you know, kind of experience to participate in. Now I'm aware from there, it morphed into kind of corporate sales. So you made this yeah. decision like, okay, business is for me. 
And I'm yeah. aware that I'm pretty, I'm inclined, you know, to be kind of in sales. So talk about that transition into corporate sales. So my last year of college, instead of going and selling books, because I had done that, I interned for a software company in Santa Monica. And the guy who owned it was, I mean, this guy, he lived next door to Johnny Carson in Malibu. He was a self-made salesperson. Okay. He didn't come from wealth. He, he was a self and a very good one. And Howard Smith was, was really my first big mentor. And Howard watched me stuffing envelopes and answering phones and scheduling appointments, sales appointments for the salespeople and said, uh, you can work here. I'll give you a full-time job when you graduate. And uh, he didn't even wait till I graduated. He actually gave it to me. So he gave me the entire East Coast. And I would go with him and he taught me and we made sales presentations to sell our software programs. And uh, then uh, I stayed in that for a while. Then he went and bought an oil company and took me there. So two completely different kinds of selling, one very white collar, one very blue collar, uh, both very, very uh, good experiences. Both teach you that the business world in selling is one that demands that you make a certain amount of calls certain amount of presentations and you better, you know, you better produce. So for me entering real estate, um, the concept of not working. In fact, when I entered real estate, I I had three jobs. Uh, I had my oil company job. I had a side job I was doing for Howard. And then I would come and I would uh, knock on doors and and make phone calls uh, whenever I got to the real estate office, two, three o'clock. And then on weekends, I would do open houses and meet people that way. So I I transitioned from corporate sales because I I didn't want to work for for a company anymore. And I wanted to make more money. Yeah. I remember you telling me that you had reached a a kind of plateau income wise where you were earning probably about the same amount as the guy who was like, you know, in charge of everything. The president of the company. The president of the company. The only (laughs) thing I didn't have was stock options. And when I learned that that was the ceiling, I thought, well, this doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense. Now you mentioned Howard being a mentor and I consider you one of my major mentors. So on those presentations, as you were going and watching him, like what were the things, those nuanced things that you picked up from him? You know, it's a long time ago. I haven't really thought about it, but I can tell you this. Um, Howard was very, very good at interjecting humor into his presentation. And sometimes you and I, our personality styles, we tend to be very focused on the end result and we need to let our hair down a little bit and just be human with people and make them laugh. Um, There's power in that. And he was the master at it. Everything he did was scripted. Uh, I can assure you he knew who Earl Nightingale was and, uh, you know, uh, all those early sales said Zig Ziglar. Um, he took us to a Zig Ziglar uh, thing back in, I don't know, 1986, probably. So um, his, you know, he just, he was, he was just, you know, he was a professional salesperson. He'd been trained properly. He followed his scripts. He was very personable. He would look at you. He would use voice inflection in the proper way. Um, he knew how to answer objections. He always let the, you know, the, uh, the prospect give their objection. He would always agree. I understand where you're coming from. Um, if I understand you, it sounds like this is what your concern is. If we can, if we can answer that and make you comfortable with it, uh, would you feel comfortable talking to us further about the, you know, all the stuff you and I do to this day. I mean, it, again, it's universal whether it be making a presentation, answering objections, closing for a contract signature, it doesn't really matter, Aaron, you and I both know this, people want to feel comfortable doing business with people. Howard was great at making you feel comfortable with him. And I watched him, you know, every word. Yeah, that's awesome. In many ways, as I'm hearing this, you retell this kind of in a chronological order. It's like in, you were groomed, right? Uh, To become the Neil Weichel, right? Uh, uh, of the real estate game. So that's, that's awesome to, to hear that that was your experience and that there were formative learning experiences along the way. Now, now when you made that transition into real estate, right? I'm curious as to what, having had all of this experience in, in like sales, right? Not right. whether it be door to door where it's gotta be this way. You got to knock at this time. You got to, you know, stop at this time with no exceptions and then in a corporate environment where it's like, okay, you got to make this amount of calls, right? Yes. And you got to produce. And then you get into this environment, which we both know is like, eh, like do whatever, whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah. Like what was, what were you, when you got in this, were you like, what are you guys doing? Like what, what was your thought process when you, you entered the business? 
Yeah, I mean, if I was being honest, look, I always like to try to be a little self-deprecating, a little bit humble, a little bit, because I just don't think that, you know, for us to be a value to the people that we that we are, whether we're coaching or training or, or role playing with, you know, people have to feel like they can they can accomplish what you've accomplished. They have to feel like and believe me, um, there were plenty of days where I was not very effective or very uh, good at my presentation or whatever. But the bottom line is, is I worked every day. And that's the big challenge I see is a lack of consistency in our business. So when I entered the business, the big thing that I noticed is people just wasted gigantic amounts of time. I just didn't really understand it. In, 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 in what I had come from before, that really wasn't an option. It didn't mean that you didn't take a client to lunch and, you know, maybe just BS for an hour, you know, as, as because these were, these were customers that you dealt with every month. It wasn't a one and done thing. Um, but you certainly didn't waste time. You know, you certainly didn't, didn't, it just, that isn't what happens in the corporate world, because if you do that, you get fired. So it's a, it's a pretty simple amount of accountability. And you've done something that's exceptional. It's really rare. It's what I would refer to as a unicorn in our game is that you've created a seventh level business, right? So you've went from being a technician, meaning the guy who's actually on the phone, beating up the phones. We used to be in role play groups together and accountability groups kind of doing that whole thing to now owning a system and owning a business that does that, right? So what I'd like to kind of ask you and, and get from you uh, for the benefit of those that are listening is that journey, right? So, so if you could share with us like a little bit about how you came to the real estate business and then kind of what it was like being a technician at first. Um, so I got in the real estate business back in 2002, um, right out of college, I jumped into life insurance and financial services. And in that industry, every day you had to be in the office and you had to pound the phones from like 9.30 to 11. It was like the golden time. And I worked for, you know, a couple like senior partners, setting appointments for them, I'd go out on appointments with them and learn the business. And uh, just after being in the business for a few years, just realizing like, you had to go out and sell products that were more advantageous to you and was going to put more money in your pocket than not necessarily doing the right job for the consumer. And <clears throat> I really didn't like that. And not only that, it was a lot of business to business sales. So when you made these phone calls, you had to get through with the gatekeepers, which was always challenging. And you were also going after like high net worth individuals who were probably double my age at the time. Um, and I just, I just didn't love it. I didn't have a passion for it. And I remember I just I got to the point where I just was like sick and tired of being sick and tired. Like literally, I was like, I'm, I'm, I've had enough. I wasn't making the money I wanted to make. I wasn't having the, the life I wanted to have. I wasn't hitting all of those things. So <clears throat> I remember I kind of, at that, I was really always good at like, you know, being the son of a builder. I kind of grew up around houses and construction and knowing knowing things and i always would work on my own houses and i was like went out one day and i picked up a book and it was like buy fix sell i was like well maybe i'll start like flipping houses and stuff and in that process i i remember sitting down one day and was like all right like here's what here's what i'm good at here's what i know how to do so here's the options i either become a real estate agent i sell mortgages or i go into construction and build houses. And I was like, all right, well, I thought to myself, God, all I remember growing up as a kid is having my dad yell at subs and being frustrated with all that. I felt like mortgages was going to put me back into that product driven business, which I just came out of. And I was like, you know, real estate sounded like it was good. My mom at one point sold real estate. My grandfather was a developer. Um, so I went out and I was like signed up for the classes and I actually understood the classes, got it, and it just felt like the right fit. So I jumped in head first, April 1st of 2002, you know, I had a mortgage, I was married, I had car payments, and my wife had a small income. So my, my I was lit to the fire, man, I really was. And it was like, you got to go out and make money and you got to go out and do this. And I went and worked for uh, a broker who I had a personal relationship with and he took me under my, his wing and I was just, he's like, you want to do this right or you want to do it wrong? I said, I want to do it right. And it just dove right in. And it was like immediately I started marketing myself to people I knew, created a database, bought Top Producer, the old school disc program. The first day I got in the business, invested 400 bucks to buy it. And I just was motivated. I was highly motivated to, to get out there. And what I liked about it is when I used to tell people that I was, 
in like life insurance and financial services, you say you're like at a dinner or you're out somewhere, you meet someone, you're like, yeah, and they, they would go like this, <laughs> like turn away. And then when you told people you're in real estate, they're like, oh, really? Tell me more about that. You know, and I got in at a time which was kind of similar to the market we're at today. Probably this is probably crazier than them, but it was same thing, multiple offers, over asking price deals, low inventory. I just got in and I, you know, in that first, you know, uh, eight months in business, I sold like 18 homes and I was making money and I was like, cool, this is, this is for me. Um, and then it just, it just grew from there. And I just had a, I just had a, a real passion for it. And I remember the biggest frustration I had in the, be the beginning was, is like, I could find the clients and I could do the, the, I could do the business and make the sales. I just didn't know how to like get through all the, you know, the ins and outs to get to closing. And that was probably the biggest frustration that I had. Um, <clears throat> about a year and a half into the business, I asked my, my wife to quit her job and she came and she started working with me and she was really like my first assistant. And then. Then after she was with me for a while, then we hired somebody and it just kind of just kind of grew from there. Yeah, that's awesome, bro, because our trajectory is similar. I, my wife was you know, kind of that first assistant as well. So I'm taking notes as you're speaking. It's interesting <laughs> because, you know, in the financial services world, whoever you were with, they essentially taught you like the process of selling, meaning like yeah. you got to be on the phone. You got to set appointments. You got to pre-qualify those appointments. You got to go on a presentation and that you got to handle objections and close. Yeah. That was very, it sounds like that was very formidable, like helpful to you because once you understand sure. that process, then you could just apply it to real estate. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you learned how to prospect, present and close. I mean, it was yeah. that simple. And I imagine that, that that created like a super competitive advantage for you in the sense that like most people who get into this game have no direct sales background and don't really understand that this is a sales business, no different than selling financial services, no different than selling roofs, no different than selling books door to door. Like it's, and as such, it must follow the same sales process. So I'm wondering how like helpful do you think that was for you? So that way, when you got into real estate, you like <laughs> did 18 deals, like right out of the gate. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I'm, I was definitely a born salesperson. I mean, I was selling chewing gum and candy, like in school, and, you know, like I was always finding ways to make money um, just because this is how I did things. And it definitely, but that was, that gave me more of the formal training that I needed to actually sit with somebody. And when you're sitting in front of, you know, a, someone whose net worth is five, 10, $20 million and they're double your age, you know, you, you learn how to be a little bit more professional <laughs> than just, you know, the kids selling candy in high school or grade school, excuse me. Um, so that was a, definitely a big advantage, but you get into real estate and you're just, you're, you're, de you're dealing with the average Joe, the average mom and pop. And it was just a, a lot easier for me because, you know, first of all, I remember getting in the business and one of the reasons I had success, and I was telling a story to someone like last week was you would call somebody back. Like if it was like a realtor.com lead or, or floor time in the office or whatever it was. And I can't even tell you I, I, how many times people would say, thank you for getting back to me. I've called several agents and, and nobody responded. Like, it's not like that today, but back then that's what it was. And, and that's how I got so much business. Cause I just would, call them, follow up, be a professional, ask them to sit down for, an, you know, to have a consultation and I would just roll with it. And it yeah. was great. That's awesome. So like the two things, it sounds like that, that experience helped you with was not only the sales process, um, but also being like super professional. And then yeah, when it went sure. to, when you went from that environment, dealing with high net worth individuals, to kind of mom and pops, it was, it was just more comfortable for you. You're like, Oh, I'm not intimidated by sure. this at all. Correct. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So then you hit the ground running. You got up to like 18 deals that first calendar year. You started to get overwhelmed, it sounded like, with the um, kind of income servicing piece. You were very good at producing the income. But then it was like, oh, mm -hmm. man, like, how do you get this to actual closing? And that's normal because, you know, my experience is, as I'm sure yours has been, is that success is a series of well-managed breakdowns. So you hit this like thing, you broke down and it's like, oh, shit, I need to figure something out. And then you pulled in some help. Now, I'm curious, once you pulled in help, what did that do production wise for you? Um, <clears throat> it definitely, so my first full year in business, so the, the next calendar year, so that would be 2003, I did like 43 deals. And I think it wasn't until, um, I think I did that year all by myself. And then my broker gave me some like conveyancing help in the office and my wife jumped in. And then I think I got, I don't remember when I got in coaching, I was like 2004 or something like that, but bringing in that my mindset was, and this is the same reason I built a team 
and why I have the team today was my mindset was do the things that you're best at and do the high income producing activities, which was being in front of people, making sales and dish out all the other stuff to someone else that can, you know, so I can leverage my time better. Um, so I'm trying to think, and I think the, I think my wife came in, I think it was like a year and a half, two years in the business. I can't remember. It was 2003, 2004, but then we slumped and then we went from like 43 to like 65. And then we were in that like 60 to 80 range for a couple of years. And then yeah. my daughter was, my daughter was born in 2006. And then we had, I guess prior to that, we had another hire. Um, but yeah, I mean, start leveraging yourself, leveraging myself and bringing in people to handle the day-to-day stuff um, allowed me to do more business, but it also, it also gave me a little bit more free time. Like I remember, I think it was 2000 and it was either three or four. Um, I was going, my wife and I were going on my good friend's father's 50th birthday cruise, like through the, you know, the um, Caribbean. Yeah. And in the first two weeks of January, I did 10 deals before I got on that cruise ship. <laughs> and I remember just like, I literally was like doing everything. I, so my, yeah, it was just, that was when it was just me still. I mean, I'm like making brochures because we used to make brochures for listings. But I'm like doing my farming. I'm like negotiating deals and I was going crazy. So besides the fact that it allowed me to do more business, it gave me back some time. And I think that's when I started to realize over time was the real estate business is a great business and it's, it gives you the lifestyle that you want. The downside is, is that you're really never off, right? We're, we're, we're constantly connected. And even at, even where I'm at now, my business today, even though I don't really do much, I do, I do selective production these days, for people I know and so forth, but you always have to be like, my clients are now my agents. So wait a minute. You mean to tell me that your son was diagnosed with cancer and not only is he cured, but you started a foundation to provide